Hey, James. Hey, Jody. Hi, Chanel. Um, hi, Karen. Hi, it's Karen. Karen. <laughs> yeah. That's right. I think we've done this before. Um, yeah. I'm Debbie. <laughs> hi. Um, which group are you from? Uh, I'm from Public Space uh, DOT. I think I'm the first topic on the agenda. I was actually just yeah. looking yeah. at Yeah, no, I yeah. do. I do want to. I do want to start with you guys. Okay. I just. I was on the the other preview call with the um, electeds, and so I know I probably you were on that. But yes, and then I have a question. Um, do you want me to like after I do the presentation questions? Do you want me to stay until the end of the meeting? Is there usually like additional questions at the very oh. end, or no, no, is no, no, it no. once I, finish, I normally I'm... would say presenters, you know, go when you wish, but I just. Um, so you mostly concentrate on plaza related things or do you like, I know public space, I know you, there's, a, yeah. you know, a lot of different initiatives. Like, are you involved in open streets at all or? Yeah. Yeah. That is my group. Um, I'm not sure if I can, I can answer general questions, but if they're for no, specific. No, I just want to say okay. if that was like directly, no, 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 yeah. that's fine. Yeah. Um, uh, but no, once you're once you're done, we'll get we'll try to get you get you out of here. Okay. No complaints. I'm happy I don't have to commute. <laughs> As I'm sure everyone else is too. <laughs> no, I just had to call somebody who had asked to kind of stick around a little later into the meeting. And I was like, you know what? It's not gonna happen. You get the <laughs> night off. <laughs> so I got to make yeah. that kind of call. Yeah. Um, oh Janine, I am not hearing you. Um, I don't actually see her. Oh, wait, she, let me, I'll take care of promotions. Wait, Waskar, is he a DOT person? Okay. Yes, Waskar is my deputy. Okay, yeah, no, I see you. Thanks, Chanel. Yeah. Yes, Waska. Hey, Bruce. <clears throat> so, Debbie, did you get an email from Lyle with a copy of the presentation? You should have, only because we are having severe outlook problems here today. I understand it's a citywide problem. I would just Ooh. heard about it this. It was I, I I haven't been able to send an email for like an hour or two, and then all of a sudden some of them will go through, and then I get kicked out. Um, and I actually it was very interesting. I just saw in one of the local newspapers that I read that the entire city council outlook was down today, and of course they weren't having it. So. Uh, so I don't know exactly what's going on. So I did ask Lyle to send you a copy of the presentation yep. oh, in case yep. I get kicked Absolutely. out of the meeting. All right. So just because I'm would like. Be, if you could, if you could cue it up for me, yep. I would feel much more confident that we aren't going to waste a lot of time getting kicked out, logging back in. Um, I... Hello, everyone. Hello, hey, James. James. Sorry, Hello, we're just going to give like another. Moment for. Um... Yeah, and I'm just going to give it to 705 because I. We have a lot going on, so I want to see if the um, assistant chair slides in he works late so sometimes runs a little bit behind um
And Janina, I'm going to have you uh, guys go right after the plaza presentation, sure. Sure. if that's okay. Yeah, yeah. I actually, I, I saw that on the agenda, so I presume that's what we would do. <clears throat> Um, Chanel, I'm going to ask you to promote Jason Compton, if you might, just because I, I he may sort of be in the presentation, part of the presentation, or, to, or we may need him to sort of speak for his part of the presentation. Hi, Jason. Um, so I would like to get started. Is there somebody? Um, hi, Carmen Paulino. Oh, of course. I knew that. Um, is there somebody that can just jot a few light notes um, just until Leo gets here? I'll jump in. Like, even if you don't capture everything, because my updates, obviously, I have in my own notes, you don't. Don't worry about taking it too closely. I mean, I can do it as long as somebody else jumps in at some point that yeah. I can I can give it my best shot. Yeah, no, and I I'm not a I don't like thanks, Bruce. So you'll you'll be back up if need be. Um, yeah, and I I like notes that are actually more summary in nature. I don't like transcriptions of any sort. So, <laughs> um, so maybe Bruce and I can can wing it together until. Yeah, as I said, I mean, Leo's often because he works right up till the, you know. Yeah, okay. Um, okay, so with that, it's 7.05. Um, I'd like to call the meeting to order. Thank you, Chanel. And I know if when, when and if you need to um, jump off, that is fine. Um, this is the, what are we? June 5th, Traffic and Transportation <laughs> Committee meeting. My name is Debbie Nabavian. I chair the committee with me tonight so far from the committee. Um, I have Jim Berlin, James Bosley, Bruce Robertson, Jay Mazur, Jody Hearson. Um, from the board generally, we have Carmen Paulino, and am I missing? Oh, Leo, you're here. Um, Good evening, everyone. Our, and Leo Jimenez, who is uh, assistant chair of the committee. Um, Leo, do you want to jump right in on notes or would you like Jody's willing to cover you for a couple of minutes as you get settled also, whichever you prefer? <laughs> oh, no, I just settled in. I'm, I'm good to go. Thank you, Jody. I appreciate it. Um, so... I'm going to do, I have a few updates that may lead to some follow-ups or discussion. So I'm going to leave sort of one part of that aside, but I just wanted to say a few quick things, and then we're going to pass it over to DOT, who has two different presentations. We have two different teams tonight, so I don't want to keep them waiting um, too long. Um so we got a notice, we get notices when um, DOT approves open streets, uh, or what's called preliminary approval. And we've had a series of them. I don't know if people remember, particularly for schools that are applying for the subsequent school year, et cetera. So we just received notice of a preliminary approval um, for PS 98. Uh, so that's 212th Street from Broadway to 10th Avenue. That will start on 9-11. Um, it's a full closed schools type. And um, that, so that means Monday through Friday, 9 to 2. Um, and they, yes, and that's PS 98. I was going to say stuff about 158th, but I actually, now that I'm looking at it, I think I'm just going to leave it to old business. Um, so, 
Oh, and then I'm sorry, I'm missing one other new member. I apologize, Tracy McNeil, of course. Thanks, Bruce. You're welcome. And thank you, Tracy and Carmen, um, for stopping into TNT, the bestest com committee, just saying. Um, <laughs> We're the best. We're the best. <laughs> um, so with that, I'm going to pass it to um, Karen Patterson from DOT uh, Public Space Group, who is going to talk to us about, I think, really a long I'm understanding about a plaza and developments at the plaza and that this was a plaza that was originally approved in 2016. Do I have my facts right from last? I, 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 I double checked and it's 2017, but that uh -huh. doesn't mean that the conversations weren't happening well before that. So, oh, um, yeah. All right. So, and I'll let you obviously introduce your team and I will, um, in my own Luddite way, start so should then I just share my screen? You know, I think I have the ability to share. So, um, and then I can just kind of flip through the slides and we can either, um, actually, let me see. Oh, okay. And I'm yeah, just I'll realizing that was the other presentation. Okay. So yeah. Yeah. You go. Yeah. And then we can either, I don't know how large this, if I'm seeing everyone here, we can either like ask questions as I present, or we can wait until the end. However, you're actually, does yeah, it. try to let's try to have you go through and then we'll open it up for questions. Any questions from the committee and then give an opportunity for any other attendees. Okay, great. Thanks. So, um, let me find my presentation here. Okay. So uh, first off, before I start, I just want to make sure everyone's looking at a slide that says Post Avenue Plaza and Shear Street. Yes. Excellent. Okay. Great. <laughs> so um, my name is Karen Patterson. I'm a senior urban designer with the public space unit at New York City Department of Transportation. And I'm here tonight. I'm going to talk to you all and answer any questions about the proposed Post Avenue Plaza and Shear Street. So first, I'm going to jump into a little bit of project context just to orient you to where we're talking about specifically within your area. So um, this project, you can see here outlined in the pink, this is roughly the project area. It's um, It extends from Post Avenue to 10th Avenue to 207th Street. Um, this is the plan of the proposed Plaza and Shared Street. So um, this project would create a plaza space and a shared street on Post Avenue. The, the light brown is the plaza space and expanded pedestrian space. And then the darker brown is the shared street. So the shared street would be a slow street with a recommended five mile per hour speed limit. Um, we are proposing here to take Post Avenue, which in this segment is two-way to one-way southbound with the southbound traffic being on the north side of Post and then the plaza and pedestrian space being on the south side of Post. Um, this addition of public space will provide opportunities for programming, events, markets, seating, and passive public space. Um, we're also looking at this as an opportunity to create some shorter pedestrian crossings across 10th Avenue and then also um, at Post Avenue on the northern side. Um, once this plaza is implemented, we will be using materials from our plaza toolkit. This is a standard toolkit that's used in plazas all over the city. That includes umbrellas, planters, granite blocks, flexible delineators, uh, marking the pavement in epoxy gravel and movable furniture. Um, now I'm going to talk a little bit about the Plaza Partnership and Management Structure. So um, New York City plazas, this plaza program is all over the city. We have over 86 plazas currently in development, construction, or they are complete. And then of those 66 plazas are currently open to the public. Um, we work closely with partners to uh, create and maintain successful plazas. Our plaza partner at this location is the Inland Merchants Association. 
and uh, the partner is responsible for basic maintenance tasks, including litter, litter removal, snow clearance, furniture maintenance, and horticultural care. And we, as I said before, we work closely with all of our partners to ensure successful public spaces. Um, an additional layer that we feel is essential to a successful public space is programming. And we work um, with our plaza partners to help provide programming that supports positive plaza use. Partners are encouraged to program their plazas regularly in collaboration with local, civic, and cultural organizations. And any organization or community group can apply for a SAPO permit to program the new plaza. And DOT works works with the organization or the community group to help um, facilitate that SAPO application process, steer them in the right direction. Um, once this, once the plaza is designated a plaza or is implemented, um, it will fall within a regulatory framework. You can see here this example of a plaza sign that will be installed in the plaza. Um, this will be on the southern, this is for the southern portion of Post Avenue, which will be designated as a pedestrian plaza. And pedestrian plazas have specific, specific code of conduct and rules that are enforced by NYPD. You can see some examples here um, of what is prohibited in the plaza. Um, then the next uh, section we'll go to is public outreach, and this will also touch on uh, some of the history the site. So um, as mentioned earlier, and in 2017, the Washington Heights Inwood Development Corporation applied to the plaza program for Post Avenue, and it was accepted into uh, the plaza program. In 2018, there were meetings and walkthroughs with elected officials and Juan Pablo Duarte Foundation. This resulted in a 29-day concession that ran through the summer into the fall. Um, we also, with our DOT street ambassadors, launched a merchant survey. However, um, later in 2018, this project was put on hold due to operational and capacity concerns. Um, um, then in 2022, we after the pandemic, uh, or later <laughs> post-pandemic, um, we worked with the Inwood Merchants Association to launch a 29-day concession that ran uh, from May, late spring through the summer last year. Um, we took the opportunity to have the New York City DOT street ambassadors come out and do some on-street outreach and surveying, and we had a number of stakeholder meetings. Oops. Um, just to get a little bit more into the details, those stakeholder meetings were comprised of 2018 meeting with the Washington Heights Inwood Development Corporation, also doing a walkthrough with Juan Pablo Duarte Foundation. Then in 2019, additional walkthroughs with elected officials. In 2020, we had a second meeting uh, with the Washington Heights Inwood Development Corporation, as well as a first meeting with the BID and the Inwood Merchants Association. In 2021, we met with uh, the Inwood Merchants Association and Representative Espayat. Then in 2020, we did a walkthrough with IMA and elected officials in the, that spring, including a visit with Councilmember De La Rosa DOT and uh, the adjacent school, the Inwood Academy. Um, in addition to our stakeholder meetings, uh, DOT has worked to provide outreach and notifications. So the 2018-29 day concession uh, with JPDF, the merchant survey in 2018, and then last year, the pop-up plaza that was launched with the Inwood Merchants Association. Uh, there was market and there was a market and there was programming, additional stakeholder meetings. Uh, later in the summer and into, into the fall, there was the uh, on-street outreach and survey with the New York City DOT street ambassadors and Columbia University uh, students as well. And then here we are now in June at our meeting notice and the Post Avenue, Post Avenue proposal to CB12. Um, just to get into a little bit of our most recent survey that was conducted, uh, it was opened in July. 17th of last year, administered by the New York City DOT Street Ambassadors on site. You can see here in a photo, we had 
booth set up with photos and there were um, staff that went around and spoke with people. There were Spanish interpreters that were available on site to assist with the survey. And the questions of the survey focused on the relationship to the neighborhood and the market, desire to see permanent plaza and other potential traffic safety elements and public space amenities. That day, that day 39 respondents participated in the survey. Um, this slide here provides a summary of the takeaways from that survey. Uh, 92 responded yes, they'd like to see a permanent plaza, three responded no, and 5% were unsure. 92% they would visit the area more if the plaza was permanent. Respondents um, wanted to see other activations in the site and amenities that included shade, greenery, and seating music performances, food vending, farmers markets, and opportunities for cultural and children's programming. And then our next subject is the traffic network. <clears throat> so as we're all aware, Post Avenue right now is an existing two-way street and with automobiles can go north, I guess north, east or south on post and turn right or left at 10th Avenue or on 207th Street. Um, this proposed plaza and shared street would convert Post Avenue to one way southbound. Uh, there would be no change to 10th Avenue and no change to 207th Street. So, and again, the, the north the northern side of Post Avenue is the southbound direction, and then the southern side of Post is the um, pedestrian space and plaza. And then let's jump in in a little bit more detail to the plaza and shared street plan. So as I mentioned earlier, the light brown is the plaza space, an expanded pedestrian space, and then there are two neck downs, one on the northern portion, of Post Avenue the, and then um, one here on 10th Avenue. And then the shared street is the darker brown. Um, you can see here that they, we would have um, planters and granite blocks, movable tables and chairs. There's the one-way shared street, the pedestrian plaza, and then the short and crossing distances for pedestrians. Um, this slide here shows the route of FDNY access. So this, with this curb extension, fire trucks can still make um, the turn. There's still access to the building or all the buildings. Um, this project will bring 9,415 square feet of public space to this area, um, 7,500 in the form of the plaza and the expanded pedestrian um, space on post and 10th, 1400 square feet in the um, neck down on the northern side of post and then a 475 square foot um, neck down on 10th Avenue. And then the change to parking looks like this. So there would be approximately six spots on post Avenue one on 10th Avenue, or one on the uh, western side of 10th Avenue, and then one on the eastern side of 10th Avenue. And then that takes us to our next steps and our timeline. So we're here in the highlighted yellow at the CB12 presentation. Um, DOT is working now to finalize the design and safety improvements for this area and receive uh, ongoing public engagement, and then we're hoping to implement the plaza and shared street later this summer. And that's all, thanks. Thank you, Karen. Um, I just wanna say a few things before I pass it to, I see a hand from uh, Jay Mazur on the committee. Um, my question will be around like, so what's there now and am I right to when I note that so it's been somewhat of an orphaned plaza and the other part of the question is when we talk about 
like, so is our inward merchants going to be using the plaza sometimes? Like what oh, kind of cutting stuff? Out. Oh, oh sorry. sorry. Yeah. Can right, you but actually, let me leave that, that one to aside. I also need to sort of say, while this isn't a rezo item and it would have become, it would become salient if it were, mm -hmm. but I want to say it anyway. Um, I work for Congressman Espayat. This is a project he loves and he's been sort of interested in and tracking since before I worked, well before I worked for him. Um, and so, um, but, uh, but maybe because I work for him and I have, and I have this role, I'm actually like very ignorant <laughs> of some of the details. Um, so you know, I, I wouldn't mind, and maybe Jason, your part could be after the committee members answer their questions, but just sort of hear a little bit about sort of Inwood Merchant Association and sort of your vision for it. Um, so we're going to start with Jay, move to Leo, and then Jim Berlin. Okay. Um, Debbie, I, I think I can answer your question or what I heard part of it. I think it was just about like the maintenance and how that works. So, um, DOT will work closely with the Inwood Merchants Association, and this plaza is also part of the Plaza Equity Program. So we contract with the Horticultural Society of New York, and they right. will provide additional uh, maintenance services to the plaza and work closely with IMA, DOT, and the but Horticultural Society. But I guess who's been, who's been doing that? So you guys have been doing that? Because... You, Wittick has been gone for years, right? Yes, the, I, I'm not sure. I don't believe the Horde is doing maintenance right now, but that's something I would have to check on. Um, so it's just know. basically, it's it's a an, it's a plaza approved by DOT, but it, it's been sort of dormant, except for the pop-up in recent we, years. Yeah, we've had a couple of 29-day concessions um, yes, in recent, yes, the pop-up plazas in recent years. Okay, thank you. Um, Jay? Yeah, first of all, it sounds like <clears throat> a very good idea. And I guess Jason's going to answer most of my questions, mainly because I live in Washington Heights, and I presume, based on the title, Inwood Merchants, association that more than one merchant is involved in it. But that's all I can surmise. And why does the DOT feel that they would be up to the task of maintaining the plaza would be my main question about it. Of course, like I said, it's a real good idea, but I don't want it to go into disarray uh, or disrepair right away as soon as it's opened. So I'd, I'd like to know more about the process of keeping it functional in that regard. Um, so I, yeah. I, I can speak to some aspects of that as far as, first of all, I'll say hi to everybody. Um, I know I remember a couple of you guys from when I was on CB12. <laughs> Great to see you. Um, so from a kind of an administrative logistics standpoint with the programming as is concerned, uh, we have a couple partners already within um, the Inwood area. And just to kind of give you a little history, a lot of the idea behind this plaza came from the dysfunctional and disarray of our street vendors. And we really wanted to try to get something organized where we can have an area for them to go, but we're in the process, we can kind of clean up <clears throat> 207 and other parts of the city. So that, that's kind of where it stemmed from. So we've been working with a lot of the street vendors and figuring out the best way that we can um, be transparent and allowing them space to do it. Um, from a sanitation aspect of it, we're we're happy that the DOT is partnering with us for clean, cleaning, but we have already secured um, two years worth of contracts for sanitation for the plaza, which includes garbage removal, which includes snow removal. So anything that the DOT would um, add in addition to that is a bonus, but the cleanliness aspect of it is, has been completely secured. <clears throat> Thanks, Jason. Um, 
Next, who did I say? J uh, James Bosley. Hello, um, I, I'm, I'm, I, I live not far from there and I am wondering, you know, um, Tenth Avenue, there's the, the number, the, the one train runs right above that plaza. So it doesn't seem to me the place that I would want to go and uh, have a pastelito or anything anything else. Not like a place you wouldn't want to go and lounge with a subway roaring overhead. Also, um, what's not on the map is that the uh, uh, Fordham Heights Bridge also empties out right there too. So it's a very trafficked area. And I'm wondering if that was taken into consideration is that the traffic patterns getting on and off the bridge. Yes, um, our traffic engineers uh, did look at this location and they determined that the closing the street or having it be southbound in one way was a, a minimal impact. Um, so to your, your comment about the, the overhead sound of the train, yes. Um, as, as we all know, New York City is, there is kind of a cacophony, right, of noise, but um, I like to think of it as maybe like the roaring ocean, <laughs> and we can hopefully bring uh, programming and other activities to this area or to this plaza that can um, in some way mitigate in terms of distraction or excitement, just that, and drown out that loud noise, so. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Jim Berlin. Hi there. Um, could you share your screen again and put on that, that aerial view showing the whole, you know, what's what that thing? Yeah. Was that um, in the beginning? No, it was closer to the end. So I have the existing uh, traffic. Oh, I um, this one? Well, actually, go back because there's one I think showing proposed traffic, and that's what I want to look yes. at. Yes. Yes. Okay. So, yeah. So um, now some of it, well, okay. People will be able at the intersection of 10th Avenue and West 207th Street to turn turn and mm -hmm. go north. Is that correct? Now, if you are heading uh, southbound. No, you're heading east. You're heading westbound on 207th Street and want to go oh. north. I think you mean east. You're going no, I mean west. I'm talking about the part of. No, I'm talking about exactly what I'm talking about. You're you're already west of 10th Avenue. Or you're east of 10th Avenue, headed west, and you want to go north. There. So you're east of 10th. Well, it says sorry. no changes at 10th Avenue. That Correct. means people will still be able to yes. turn north. Yes. Now, yes. Um, in order to get from southbound, let's call it southbound 10th Avenue to 200 to um, westbound 207th Street. Um, they will have to use this this one lane of southbound Post Avenue, right? This well, I mean, they can do, they can. Well, they could also yes. make a left turn at um, 207th Street. And yes. so they yes. have two options. Yeah, let's, yes, correct. Because there's so a fork if, there. Yes. Yeah, right. So go... Now, my thinking, okay, and this is just off the top of my head, and I am not one of your clever engineers, but I've been around a while. Um, the They don't need two options necessarily to go from southbound um, 10th Avenue to um, westbound. So what I would do, or I would contemplate anywhere, suggest you look at, is where you have the, the, the upper part of the fork, you know, the, 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 I would just get rid of that and make all of that plaza with the option mm -hmm. of fire engines going down there. And now, I mean, there may be a lot of traffic that, that actually goes south on um, 10th Avenue and then makes that right turn. Mm -hmm. But if there isn't, then I, I would just get rid of the fork, keep everybody on 10th Avenue and only use the, the post Avenue section there as um, you know, a fire lane or whatever. Yeah. Now, again, it may be as it is because your engineers determine that there is all that traffic, but that's what I'm asking about. Yeah, yeah, we are, our hope is to, um, at some point in the future, uh, if, if feasible, um, 
create a full plaza on Post Avenue. Um, at, at this stage, uh, we are not able to. We will be taking, um, once this plaza or the shared street and plaza are implemented, we will be doing spot checks just to monitor traffic. And um, one thing that that I uh, like to tell people and that, that I find it's great is we use temporary materials for this project. So um, that means that it's easy to make modifications um, down the line. So if, now, if we, yeah. Is there a traffic signal at Post Avenue and um, 207th Street or is the only traffic signal at um, 10th Avenue? Um, that's a great question. I believe there's a traffic signal. I want signal. to say there is a signal, yes. Yeah, yeah. There is. yeah. I think everything's signalized there because yeah. it's mayhem. Okay, that's, that's good. So, you know, among us chickens here, you could actually play games and, and ultimately make it more difficult to use that Post Avenue thing as a shortcut, you know, by fiddling with the signal timing. Yes. Because ideally, I think if, if we can make the make make all of that real plaza and not a shared street, I think that'd be so much better for everyone. Yeah. Okay. And, That's that, I'm, and I'm happy to see that you already thought of that. This makes me very happy. And I agree with my colleagues that, you know, th this is definitely something we should and again, it's done with temporary materials. It's not that expensive. So we can try it. Ideally, it will work. It's not going to be modified. And if worse comes to worse, we'll just not do it. Yeah. Thank um, you. Yes. Yeah. Thank you for that. I also will add, um, as I had mentioned in that last slide, slide we're still um, looking at the design. So one of the considerations is signal timing. And, and I will bring that back to our um signals team um, just to that idea about like what happens if you are going southbound and um, run to 107th street and giving maybe additional crossing times for folks. Yeah, I just, I'm just wondering if the sort of maintaining that southbound option is slightly just because 207 and 10th is an intense place on in the world. So to the extent you can divert a little bit, but it has to be somebody who's willing to be diverted at five miles an hour. Um, it does take just a squinch of pressure off that in volume at that intersection. Um, we're going to go Leo Jimenez and then Marshall Vanderpool. Thank you, Karen, uh, for the thorough presentation. I have a question about the outreach. Uh, what, what was the communication with the neighboring businesses? I know with this uh, plaza, you guys will be taking about 11 to 12 total parking spots. Um, so also add to that, on the 10th Avenue, you guys are uh, extending the curb, but it seems for a shorter um, walkway, a uh, shorter uh, crosswalk. If people can only go heading from the bridge uh, west, if people could only make a left there, because uh, I believe 207 is turning into a one way from what I saw. No, 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 no. Two, 207 will stay exactly as it is. Um, no, nothing is changing on 207. Um, okay. If you were, if you were on 207 and you're going uh, north on 10th Avenue, there is a curb extension, which yeah, is, the is there, yeah, to shorten the crossing distance and to also um, signal to cars to slow down. Okay, but it, it maintains the two-way uh, for dirt traffic, okay. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, I'm just curious about the outreach to the businesses. Uh, so, the, mm -hmm. yeah, it's, it's gonna take a few spots. So yeah. see what they're, they're yes. Yes. So um, there. So the outreach that was done last summer, the street ambassadors spoke with the merchants, and they were in support of the space as a plaza. And there was also a survey done in I think that was 2018. Um, we want to also, again, as as the as we're still working on the design. Um, look at opportunities for loading zones so that merchants can easily load and unload their goods um, and have a, a designated area to make that happen. Um, 
Um, and, and then, sorry, just to add, there there will be parking. So the, the red here on this plan indicates where parking will be removed, um, but there still is parking on the north side of Post Avenue. Okay. Um, Marshall? Uh, yes, uh, good evening. Um, I apologize that I was a little late, maybe joining the chat and it is 10th, well, first is 10th Avenue still uh, two directions? Yes. Yes. Nothing is changing the, um, the, let me see if I can, so the, this pedestrian space here, this is extending to the columns. Um, but the, the the traffic is not the direction of traffic and the flow of traffic is not changing. Okay, because I guess my confusion lies in this. I at one time saw signage where uh, southbound traffic on Tenth Avenue was encouraged to go through that area, which where where the mall would be that short section of post Avenue. So then uh, it would relieve the pressure of turning traffic cause you would go up post Avenue. And when you got to 207 street, you would make a left so that you could get to the bridge. I mean, it is very, very, very hazardous as far as trying to make that left turn or um, traveling south on 10th Avenue, making that left turn into 207 Street. There's a lot of traffic trying to get to the bridge there. And a lot of people have problems navigating the columns of mm. the elevated subway. Yeah. And uh, uh, I mean, I'm not sure. I mean, I'm not. I. I'm not sure what's trying to be encouraged here. I mean, 207 Street, uh, and I don't want to sound disparaging, think of it as a O. Henry reference, but it looks like Baghdad, the way you got all the uh, vendors, people selling their used goods uh, on 207 Street. And it looked like they were trying to use that space uh, that that section of Post Avenue as a as an area to relieve instead of it being on the sub on the sidewalks in front of the store shops uh, that they had a space where they could continue selling whatever they were selling and like I said to take away that stretch of Post Avenue would create more pressure at that intersection mm -hmm. as far as turning traffic. And um, I'll, I'll land my plane here and, and allow the comments. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So, to, yeah, just if I think I'm understanding, I know there's two parts of the question, but to clarify, the vendors, street vendors, part of the idea is that they would be able to access the newly expanded plaza and they and that they would those are the vendors that marshall just described that would then move into the plaza from the sidewalks at 207th street that's correct yeah mm -hmm. okay so that seems helpful and um I guess I would say, and, and then Marshall, just jump in if I'm not reframing this part of it in a way you like, but I think you're hearing a lot of comfort with the plaza, but we'll, we'll always like, this is such a tough intersection. It's dangerous. And the craziest stuff happens here in part because of the being the, the polls, what, what Marshall said it better. Um, and just all the traffic. 
and just all the crazy. Um, and yeah, that's the essence. I guess I would yeah. just ask the deal, and I, oh, yeah. I've asked this for years, like, I know it's never going to be perfect over there. And I like that we're chipping away at one little part to try to bring more sanity. But I hope we continue to look at this. Mm -hmm. I always say the 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 craziest crash I've seen was there. And it was a bigger car ran into was uh, turning towards the bridge from 10th Avenue going northbound and crashed into a smaller car and then just kept going. So literally, and I've never seen this, it was like a cartoon, drove over the top of the little car and kept going. It was really quite sensational. Um, so I guess maybe I'm asking, does DOT view this as maybe, while it's not directly impacting that intersection, that just like it between the the curb extensions at 207th and 10th Avenue and just having one less option around there like do you feel like that'll add to a a modicum of calming or you think it's really about you'll get a benefit for pedestrians but it probably isn't going to change the 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 congestion yeah. scene well so first that your example illustrates illustrates your point. Um, I mean, there there I will say there are always bad actors, and there's only so much right that the DOT is capable of doing. Um, but adding pedestrian crossings, also looking at signal timing, and um, just hearing more about this intersection, I will when go back and talk to our geometric design team about some potentially neck downs or safety improvements that we could make to the south side of 207 and 10th Avenue um, just to see if we can further calm traffic. So um, it, it, you know, it's like a pin cushion. You have to have insertions at many different points. Um, and um, I, yeah. And then I think I think that in the next presentation, there there's a little, I know this is slightly further south, but we might be hearing about yeah. some 10th Avenue improvements, but I don't know if it'll affect here. All right. I guess what I'm saying is we're getting some things sort of as a offshoot of this, but I don't want, and I know this isn't a current issue, but Lyle, I just want you to hear like, we will be ever more open to 207th sanity projects um because it's it's tough out there um i have one question ruben perez from our attendee list yeah thanks debbie uh great presentation karen i have a question about the survey that was you did. Do you mind going to that slide again? Yep. Um, I have the most recent one um, from the yeah that day of outreach. This is this one. I mean, these are the kind of the the summary, and then this is just the like bullet points. Oh, yeah, that's great. Thank you so much. And yeah. I guess I'm curious to know um, if the the categories. If you go back to the other slide. Mm -hmm um about the activities that they would like to see were they uh are these pre sort of like just determined categories or are these open-ended um i would have to look at the survey to see if we had an other or a suggested suggestion section and it may be available on our dot current projects page um but typically uh with our survey when we ask about programming, we have some general categories or programming and amenities. And uh, some of that like greenery, seating, shade, those are those are built around our toolkit page, which was shown earlier in the presentation because we provide umbrellas, movable mm -hmm. tables and chairs, planters. Um, and then we have a programming catalog that we share with and um, as a starting point for our partners. Um, which includes um, musicians, dancers, circus, theater, et cetera. So um, 
Does that answer your question? I mean, yeah, it's, like, yeah. it's like I'm it's it's not coming from I'm not pulling it's not pulled from thin air. Um so yeah, so there there's some parameters to what we put in. Yeah, no, thank you so much. And mm -hmm. I guess I have a follow-up question, but yeah. you kind of answer I'm just curious to know would there be any follow-up studies just to gauge if like any like public opinion might have shifted since um yeah, I mean we typically like we try to do post-implementation surveys. Um you know, typically, or in my experience, there's a period of acclimation, you know, a few months, depending on the season, you know, if it's implemented early in the summer, so people can be outside and get used to it, or if it's in the fall, uh, we may be six months later or eight months later, we would do a survey and um, we have our street ambassadors go out and they survey folks in the area and just ask them about their experience, what they like, what they don't like, what their perception is, et cetera. Um, and then, so that's the user-based um, post-implementation survey. And then the other piece of data that we try to get is taking uh, spot traffic counts once, mm -hmm. uh, once a project is implemented, just to get a better understanding, again, like after a period of acclimation, like how um, traffic has adjusted and um, if there are pressure points or not, or how that's kind of unfolded. That's and then from the Inwood Merchant Association perspective, we've had a couple of um, public meetings on it. And as implementations begins, we're actually really going to look to the to the community's input as to what they want to see as far as that goes. I mean, we're, we're going to follow these surveys, but there will be more of a um, you'll have more direct access through us as far as the programming things. And we'll be extremely transparent with that. Great. Are any of these data like available? Wait, I'm we'll sorry, Ruben, we, we don't. Actually, I, and I should have sort of laid the ground a little bit. We don't, we don't have a, like a back and forth. Oh, okay. So, sorry. Um, sorry. Yeah. Sorry. No, no, no. That that's okay. I should have. I didn't do something I should have done. Um. So. Um. I. Am. Well, thank you to the DOT team and. Um, Excuse and me, Jason my hand Compton. Up. I have a question. Oh, I'm sorry. That's a new hand I didn't realize. Go ahead, Jay. Yeah. Um, uh, first of all, on the question of street vendors, I understand why store owners don't want them <clears throat> on their streets. <clears throat> but from my point of view, they give consumers another choice. And they're allowing many people a chance to get into the money economy. And I think those are both good points. And in terms of plazas, if the experience is anything like the um, Plaza de las Americas, the one next to the Lowy's 175th Street, what it accomplished when it opened was it allowed a uh, uh, space on the street for new street vendors to occupy and didn't end street vending in any way, shape, or form. And I, actually, the Plaza de las Americas doesn't have very many tenants anymore, but I think it's viewed as a neighborhood amenity on 175th Street. Uh, it allow you know it's nicer than what was there before. People enjoy the chairs and so on. There's public events there on occasion, um, and, and I think that experience might 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 possibly be a factor again. I just wanted to mention that. Yeah, I mean, so the one problem that I have, like on 185th Street with vendors is, you know, the busway was put in and all this work done around like the mix of the meter spots and the kind of meter spots. And is it the kind you're just coming in for like 15 minutes versus like meters that you could stay at for two hours, whatever. And there are whole swaths where none of those spots are open because the vendor's vans are parked there and they just feed the meter all day. 
And so this would be a tough, even tougher spot because it's an even smaller spot if we're, you know, we're losing any parking spots and then like, I don't know how the, you know, how it's working there, but um, I mean, that's sort of a, not necessarily a conversation here, but it is one thing I think about. Um, I would, um, but it's a, looks like a good design having a new merch, new maintenance partner and the engagement of Inwood Merchant Association. Um, let's hope for success. Um, I think this conversation has been a good one in terms of um, you know, sort of the various things that we needed to watch out for. Um, I would say if there's any ability for DOT to request NYPD to, to throw in a traffic person or two in the first week or two to just be helpful because right you know it's a complicated area we're closing off something people used to be able to access and it just might be helpful to help people be their best selves um and all right i'm gonna allow one more bruce but then i we, we need to move on do we want a resolution for this or I think no, have... it it they actually don't need one because it's already a plaza. Um thank you. So it's not, yeah. Um, I raised my hand before you said that. Okay, make it quick, thank James. You. Oh, very quick. I, I just thought about you again that that the, the post avenue way of getting to 207th Street. The more I think about it, the more we don't want cars there. Because there was that incident the other day where some idiot drove the wrong way down a wrong one-way street and all this stuff. So I think again, if, if we can keep the cars and the people separate and make more, you know, real estate for the people, we should do that. So I would ask DOT to actually consider that particular plan, get rid of that, that other, that other thing. Of course, if there's too much traffic, that's another story, but let's look at that. Thank you. Thanks, Jim. Um all right. So with that, thank you, Karen. Thank you, Jason. Great to see you. Um, and I am going to now ask Jolene and Wasker to step in and um, let me know if you need me to share. Could you, screen. Debbie, could you please share the presentation? I think that's going to be helpful. Yes. Our the... outlook seems to have gotten a little bit better, maybe because a lot of folks went home. But um, I've been kicked out of uh, a lot of meetings today. <clears throat> Are you guys seeing anything yet? Not yet. Uh... There we go. Okay, looks like it's starting up. Okay, if you just move me into presentation mode, we can. Um, sorry, sorry, Oops. sorry. Am I not seeing where to do it because. There you go. There I go. Sorry, because it launched my browser rather than the. Okay. Okay, so I will just ask you as we move along to just advance. Um, so let me take a moment to uh, thank Board 12 for having us back. Uh, we've been with you on a number of projects, so thank you for having us this evening. Uh, let me um, introduce my, uh, again, my Executive Director, Waskar Robles. He's my Director of Community Affairs. I'm the Executive Director of Community Affairs and the Chief of Staff in Bridges. So we wanted to spend just a few minutes tonight um, taking you through uh, the PS5 pedestrian bridge. Um, let me just say before we advance, some of you know from my past presentations, we have almost 800 bridges in our inventory in New York City. This is one of the most unique. Um, and so we wanna take you through a little bit of the history 
what's going on with the bridge right now, and what we think the next steps are. Can I advance, Debbie? So this bridge, what's unique about it, other than the location, is that this bridge was essentially put up very quickly uh, back in 1987. Um, there is no one here anymore who has a complete history, uh, but the bridge was essentially put up by two groups. One was what we call our when and where contractor, but largely supported by DOT employees as well. It was put up very quickly. It was intended to be a temporary bridge. Again, I don't have the whole history on, on why it was intended to be temporary, but the bridge has long outlasted its useful life. Uh, we spent some time trying to keep it together. Um, as noted on here, the last major improvements were done in 2018 when we did a significant redecking of the steps and the span. Uh, the problem that we have now is that the bridge is deteriorating. And the single most important thing is that it is not ADA compliant, uh, which prohibits us from putting any capital money into it. And in good faith, we really are not supposed to be spending our expense budget to keep something up also that's not capitally eligible. And so we, um, we think we have a better plan. So just a little background on this. This um, chart might be a little hard to follow for a second. Uh, we'll take you through it. As you can see, there is a period of time in the morning when the number of folks using the bridge is somewhat high. Um, again, not significant for us in terms of our pedestrian bridges, uh, but mostly used by adults. If you see in the blue, um, the school kids are in the green and they are not significantly using, using the bridge at almost any time of the day. If you go across the chart in the green and the blue, you'll see that most of the children are either boarding school buses or using one of the crosswalks. Um, and the, um, the orange is all of the folks that are basically using the at grade crosswalk. So the bridge itself is no longer really uh, being used for what it was there for. The peg counts are very low. Uh, most people don't want to divert to go up a flight of stairs, across the street and back down uh, when there's an at-grade crossing uh, with the signals. Can move ahead. So just to demonstrate for those who are not familiar with the immediate area, there are at this point three at grade crossings that exist here. The one at the south end is the one with the green circle is at the intersection. And then the one in the blue circle is the one that we refer to as the parks department access crosswalk that's there with a signal. And then we actually have the, the red crossing, which is, which is the bridge. Um, and those are the crosswalks that are being primarily used by school children and people who live in the community uh, to get across uh, 10th Avenue. Debbie? Okay, sorry. I was just it's okay. I was just absorbing the information. <laughs> um. so, so the next two slides, I don't have a team member, unfortunately, who was available with me tonight to talk at length about the upcoming capital improvements. <clears throat> These are capital improvements that will be performed by others in the future, not through the Division of Bridges. We understand there is um, an interim project in FY24. And I heard as recently as last week that there is a capital project that's in design for 10th Avenue that the board may well know about. Um, and all of these will serve to further improve uh, the intersection and how the intersection operates um, in the in the longer term. And I know Lyle will be able to help us get the right folks back to you to fill in the blanks on the capital projects. As said, unfortunately, they were not available to join me tonight. But just the, the dotted orange limit of DOT inward safety project, does that refer to an area that is one of the capital projects or a funded project, or do you not know? I don't know for certain, but I do believe that is part of the capital, upcoming capital improvement, because it will involve building out the curb, 
And that's, yeah, you know, sometimes we do those through our own staff, through our SIM, which is our sidewalk inspection management team. <clears throat> and, but it will also include some other build out items. Um, I don't know, Lyle, do you have any information you can offer at the moment? Yeah, I was gonna say, I think that's part of uh, the overall Inwood rezoning um, and that's upcoming. So I know if there's some capital improvements that are supposed to come on 10th Avenue around the 201st Street area. So just north of where the bridge is. And I think it's gonna trickle down a little bit towards uh, the area by the bridge. But I think this is more uh, talking about that intersection by 201st and 10th where that new school is in, uh, in the process of being built. Okay. All right. Okay. Well, yeah, so let's, we'll come back to that, I guess, in the fall, Lyle, because I would, we would be quite interested. This is another rough spot. Mm -hmm. All of, all of that area of Inwood, we know is, is really congested and is a real concern with the number of businesses that are there as well as the residential area. Um, so again, this is a, another slide that We'll have to have a capital team come back and fill in for you. There's a lot of information packed in here um, that I I don't know, Lyle, if you have specifics that you can share tonight on the um, on the future capital project, or we should just put this as a placeholder for a future conversation for the board. Yeah, there are a couple. Well, yeah, there are a couple of things going on there. Um, at least I'm aware of as far as uh, parks having a project over there, uh, pretty much by the Sherman Creek area. A lot of it is, uh, I think, the Sherman Creek build out uh, into a park or into parkland, as well as the school, I guess, on 10th and 1st. Um, so there's going to be quite a bit of activity in this area, uh, not so long in the future. Um, but that's all I think part of uh, the overall Inwood rezoning. Okay. Okay. So you think most yeah. most of these two images here on the side we're looking at relates to rezoning and projects associated with that? Is that what you're saying? Ideally. Um, so like I said, parks and um, you know, other agencies will be, you know, along this stretch more or less, um, you know, over the coming years. Um, but I think in the immediate area of the bridge, uh, that's going to be primarily parks work. And again, work, you know, dedicated to uh, the school, uh, just more of a bridge. Okay. This is raising more questions than it's answering. Um, okay, so I'm going to move on and then Lyle, Thank you, Debbie. Have to come back to this in the fall. Thank you, Debbie. So, so this is just a, we wanted to just give you a, a basically sort of an order of magnitude of what's happening with the bridge. We have been monitoring it regularly. And you'll see there that part of the problem is that this is a structure again, because it was uh, put together very quickly as a temporary basis. The intention was in its design was not to have our typical bridge 50 to 75 year life. And so every year, the number of uh, holes we get in the stringers and in the floor beams just increases dramatically. And so we have had this 10 fold increase in the actual what we call flag conditions and flag is just another bridge term for defect. Um, every individual defect that identifies identified is given a flag report. And so you can see the tenfold increase in the number of, um, of defects that were identified each time our team goes up there. Um, load rating factor, it, gets, it can get complicated quickly, but basically any bridge that is low rated under one is considered not up to current safety code, even though this only serves pedestrians. Um, my former boss used to love to tell us that pedestrians actually weigh more than cars. Uh, not that on a pedestrian bridge, you would have, um, if you will, shoulder to shoulder pedestrians you know, on a ped bridge. But if you thought for a moment about a parking space, uh, which is usually about 10 by 22, if you have a vehicle in there, it can be four, five, six thousand pounds. The SUVs now are, of course, much heavier. If you had people shoulder to shoulder to shoulder in a parking space, the people would weigh more than the car. Uh, it's just a, a kind of a cute meme that our former Bridges Commissioner used to um, want to share with us. And so that's why even on ped bridges, we're concerned about a load rating uh, for pedestrians because it is at this point it has fallen under. 
And we have a couple of pictures here to demonstrate kind of what's going on. I always refer to these as the icky bridge pictures. We don't like kind of actually sharing what's going on, but particularly the one in the lower right demonstrates really what's happened even since we last got a paint a coat on the steel, a coat of paint on the steel, um, which is something we, need, we do on a regular basis. And you can see that is uh, commonly referred to as section loss. It's essentially from wind, rain, weather, salt, and all just general being out in, in the climate of what happens uh, to the steel and the bridges. The lower left is a little harder to see because it was dark there, but you can see there are three additional holes there. Um, and then in the upper left, you can see the wooden uh, planks on the bridge. Basically, there are holes underneath almost every one of them. And that's where the planks meet the, um, the, the girder that's the main span girder. Every one of those is basically where the wooden planks touch the bridge because of the water that's on the wood and then the salt and then that drains right, right through there. Um, and this is basically kind of where we were at. Uh, just wanted to say that we did uh, have a bit of a urgent situation back uh, the week of the 22nd where our inspection team went up and found some pretty advanced deterioration and so we had to close the bridge on that date so that we could come back and get the right crews present. Uh, the inspector was there <clears throat> and we had to call a repair team out very quickly. We did get the bridge open the next day. And our goal at this point is to continue to keep the bridge open at least through the end of the school year for the folks who do use it. Um, but again, where we are at this point is we're very concerned about the structural capacity of the bridge to, um, to support the pedestrians who do wanna use it. And um, as you can see from here, we just did a quick kind of back of the envelope estimate that the repair of the bridge, if we were legally allowed to do it, would be about $400,000 to keep the bridge as is. And to remove it, we're thinking it's going to cost somewhere in the neighborhood of about $100,000 or $150,000. So the next steps, what's not in this presentation here for you tonight, the next steps of what we're planning to do is to mobilize a team at the end of the month, right after school closes, to begin to bring to take the bridge down. Um, and we will be working with all of the local first responders and all of the local community stakeholders to be sure everyone's aware of the plan to remove the bridge um, so that we don't have to um, continue to basically have a bridge that's not ADA compliant that we keep trying to patch together. All right. Thank so you. So that's where we are. Thank it's you. a sad day when we have to come and tell you that we have to take a bridge down. It's just this is not a happy conversation, uh, but we think that the bridge has really served its useful life and it's time for it to go. Well, <clears throat> I know it's a sad day for you guys, but I, I'm, you know, looking at utilization numbers and because most people are choosing to to cross the street rather than kind of going out of their way a little bit and then up the stairs and down the stairs like it's it makes to me it makes it a little better um i see hands up if you have your hand up but that's an old hand just lower your hand and let me see where we're at if anybody has any questions so bruce marshall and jim are those all new hands Okay, so Marshall and then Jim. I think he's trying to unmute. There he goes. Yes, yes. I, well, I got two computers going. I got two mouses and I grabbed the wrong mouse. <laughs> um, now, I was looking at the statistics as far as the use and it doesn't amaze me because the fact is, as I understand things, that bridge was built to support the school. Back, well, I'm getting old, but 
at one point in the community, there was a real pressure on having chairs for our younger students and schools needed to be built. And they found that location. And that location is a very dangerous location as far as Harlem River Drive, 10th Avenue, uh, where people are trying to get to that 207 Street Bridge we were talking about. I mean, I'm chagrin at the short-sightedness in the vision that was exercised in constructing that bridge because I don't know. I, I mean, that school is like the only thing that's over there and why it would be mainly used. And uh, I, I, SMH, shake my head. I, 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 I don't quite understand it. I see the problem. I mean, you're going to take it down. You're going to put another one up, or, or is this still part of the decision process? We don't have a plan right now to replace the bridge. Um, one of the things that we have a great challenge with when we do get requests for new pedestrian bridge is that in order to comply with ADA, the bridge ramps down to the street would probably be longer than the existing span over the bridge, which would make the trip longer. Um, the newest ADA codes are one over eight instead of uh, one over 12. Jim, Jim will correct me if I'm wrong. Um, I keep forgetting which way that ratio goes, but they've essentially in the latest ADA regulations made all of the ramps flatter. And so every 30 feet, you have to have a landing before you can rise again for another distance of 30 feet. So over the distance of between X and Y on those flights of stairs, which you can see are pretty steep, the bridge would be much, much longer. It would have a much bigger impact and footprint in front of the school and in some ways probably be less desirable because we would have to have that many more ramps. Um, the other issue is we would have to uh, secure funding for, for a new pedestrian bridge. The most recent one that we replaced is now about nine years old over the FDR Drive and it was at 78th Street. Um, it's a lovely bridge. It cost about $15 million in 1978. So you can imagine what the cost would be now. It's very cost prohibitive to put a pedestrian bridges when the rest of the agency, people like Karn in our planning division and in our plazas and safety people feel that the safety upgrades that are going to be proposed to come in behind us will provide a safe and safe environment for the students and the teachers and the people to cross where they really prefer to cross, which is at the intersection. <clears throat> and that's basically at this point, we feel that the at grade crossing is going to be more than complete compensation for the removal of the bridge. Thank well, you. just real quick, sounds like uh, light timing and you better get some um, traffic guards or whatever as far as that. I mean, I don't see another bridge coming back considering the ADA and um, if anybody knows, when when did ADA get promulgated or whatever? 2006. Oh, okay. The Americans so with Disabilities Act is 2006 and they've been... Okay, so that's, that's well after the bridge was yes. built, I guess. Yes. Okay. All right, I'm going to land my plane here. Thank you. Yeah, Thank just you, Marcel Vanderpool. Yeah, oh. just one thing to add. I was going to say when we uh, did some, when we did the bike lanes on Dykeman a few years ago, part of the project was to do some pedestrian safety improvements on the 10th Avenue side because we knew how dangerous it would be. Um, so we have shortened the pedestrian crossings at the intersection by 10th and Dykeman. And if I recall, um, traffic agents don't fall under DOT jurisdictions, I think. Um, the school I know, um, at least in previous conversations in the past, um, I, th yeah, I know they were either looking at getting some crossing guards around there. I think they've been able to get some. Um, yeah. But these yeah, for I'm, that. Oh, sorry? Yeah, I'm sure they are. Oh, yeah. So I, I, 
for at least in my experience going uh, into that area, you see it usually, you know, most people, including kids and parents, use, you know, that 10th Avenue intersection to cross, um, as opposed to going all the way up to the bridge, crossing the bridge, going back down, and then going to the corner, and then going to the school. So, um, Sure. Anybody with a stroller or a child in a stroller or a, you know, a shopping cart with some purchases they might have made, they can't get up the stairs and over. Um, there's a number of young families there. And so all of those folks are crossing at grade. And frankly, people don't have the patience to go up the stairs. People are. No one trying to make the bell at the school is, is doing, is adding an extra like 10 minutes. Um, Jim Berlin. Thank you. Um, a few, I got a lot to say. Uh, number one, I want to thank Matt Marshall because he basically set the stage and I'm going to put in some additional information, but this bridge has been a very strange thing from the very beginning. I believe the slope of ramp still is one to 12, but as, as um, there we go. was pointed out, every 30 feet, you need a, a respite. So it levels off and people can rest like if they're, they're you know, tired or whatever. Um, it turns out, and then basically echoing what Marshall said, this community board said as loud as it possibly could at the time, don't build PS5 in that stupid place at the end of the highway. Of course, you know, despite our wonderful community boards, the city doesn't always listen. And there it is, of course. And people were horrified. And the bridge, number one, was supposed to have been a permanent bridge. Now, you'll see where this gets in just a second. Furthermore, Stuyvesant High School and their bridge were already in existence at this time, and we expected elevators on both sides of the bridge. So it would have been, you know, handicapped accessible. None of this was done. Basically, there was an outcry for a bridge, and the politicians at the time, and I don't have any idea of who, you know, how it all worked, they decided to just put up the cheapest bridge they, they could, which didn't really meet the needs, wasn't handicapped accessible, wasn't going to be permanent, almost like, you know, the stupid design of the, the, Verizon, the, the Tappan Zee Bridge that was only designed to last 50 years. I mean, what kind of dumbness is that? But anyway, so they threw up this thing just to shut up the public, probably quite cynically. And here we are doing exactly <laughs> what, you know, we, we need to do. The bridge was not constructed you know, per, in a permanent manner. We, we're gonna have to take it down. And as was pointed out, although ideally you'd like to have separate spaces for cars and pedestrians, you know, if you do traffic control right, um, then um, there, there's, you know, things can work quite well. And, and let me just get back to my previous point on, on the, you know, the, the, the plaza there. If we're going to have a five mile an hour street, that five mile an hour sign must be as big as all outdoors, you know, because otherwise no one's going to, well, they claim they're not going to see it. So, but that, that's just back, getting back to the other thing. So this bridge was basically a cynical exercise and here we are carrying it down as they knew at the time we were going to have to. So I congratulate everyone for keeping it up as long as it can was unnecessarily inconvenient. And when we saw what the bridge was, we just rolled our eyes. So there we are. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Jim. Thanks for the background. Um, all right. Janine, Wasker, thanks for the info. So um, we will, I just, we will be um, back in touch with the board and everybody involved about the actual demolition plan. We don't have a date specific at the moment. Um, we're working very closely with our first responders, PD and fire uh, to make sure that the, the period of time we, we decide to do this uh, makes sense for everybody and that all the staff we need is present. Uh, it will require two cranes uh, to be brought to the site. The bridge will be lifted down onto vehicles that will transport it. We have a, um, a contract with a scrap vending service that will pay us for the reserve uh, steel, which is, is still desired. They will, they will separate the wood from, from the steel and salvage what they can, and the city will be compensated for that. 
Um, and so we'll be back to you when we know more about the actual schedule. All right, great. And just, I know that you guys are well on top of all the outreach and notification and CB12 can communicate whatever, but um, if you, <clears throat> I would imagine communicating at um, the Dykeman houses, you, we get a lot of people who are right close by. And if there's any issues getting to them, Marshall can be helpful. I'm just going to volunteer him. Um, Thank you. That, that's another that's one very, of our. That will be very, members. very helpful. Uh, Wasker on my team has been up there walking around. We've kind of really tried to dig in and make sure we're getting on the ground people. But Mr. Vantable, if you do have specific contacts, they are a tenant president, uh, management staff. We would appreciate all those contacts and and Debbie, we always appreciate the board pushing it out. I mean, I, I would yeah. think of putting putting my email in the chat, and then can maybe they can share the contacts with me. Sure. Um, you can give it to that, me now. So either one works. Yeah, I mean, and we can also connect people. Um, Waskar, if you want to put the your info there, and then and Marshall, you don't have to volunteer for this. So I can also have uh, Ebenezer reach out to Miriam, but um, yeah. I'll just leave you with one uh, with one thing. We do have what we call a one pager. We have um, streamlined our toolkit, if you will, uh, so that we don't prepare complicated brochures anymore for our projects. We have a nice succinct one pager about the, the bridge and the need to remove it. We'll be sharing that with you um, tomorrow so that everybody on the board can have a copy. You can share it with the entire board your entire outreach network. Um, I have to say, I I get more information out of Board 12 than any of the 59 community boards in New York City. Ebenezer and the staff have me on every single committee, and I, I definitely appreciate all that information. I wish every community board um, did as good a job pushing out the information to people on the city side like me. Um, I really appreciate it. It takes a minute to scroll through it and take a look at it. Um, and I appreciate the effort to push out so much information. Um, well, thank you for saying that. Oh, how's that feedback a lot? Please let, let him know that it, it is appreciated, all the information. They push out a tremendous amount of information from your staff. Um, yeah, no, sometimes I feel like, ah, because, you know, as a board member, we see it in duplicates, so then I get, it gets I, overwhelming, but I, I appreciate you saying that. That's that's wonderful. Um, all right. Well, thank you um, to Bridges team. I'm just uh, now going to ask Lyle to sit to stick around because I feel like every update has to do with DOT, Lyle, um, of just sort of more old business stuff. And I also want to say, just because I am the worst person at staying on top of the chat, but we have been joined by Isidro Medina, um, community board member and chair of licensing. Um, and um, hi, Maria Luna, we already miss you. And... So, and then Leo Jimenez, I don't know if I was, you, I had said this prior to arriving or after you arriving, but we have two of our new board members, newest board members here tonight, Carmen Paulino and Tracy McNeil. So I want to make sure they're, you know, reflected in the minutes and um, with that, I'm going to move to uh, various updates and Lyle, you're going to have to help me because I'm sure. Debbie, are yeah. we, are we released? You are released. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Cluster. See Thanks you all very me. soon. Good night. Okay, good stuff. Good night. Um, so first off, I wanted to just cover some old business items uh 158th street and the upper roadway of, well all the roadways of riverside drive um the raised crosswalk which i had very high hopes for as really being a straightforward and wonderful solution to our problem of the 
you know, mile long crossing at 158th Street um, is not possible at that location because if people can kind of visualize in their heads, you're kind of at the bottom of a hill and there are no catch basins there. So basically there would have to be like a DEP capital project to install catch basins after which point it could maybe be possible. So longer term, we can think about whether we wanna team up with Steve, with the Health and the Environment Committee to put that on our capital request um, because I think it really, really, really would be a good spot for it. But in the near term, it's it's sort of not DOT and it's a big, it's a big project um, in that it's a capital project. The curb cuts are possible. And this is an is one another good thing of the fact that we did the walkthrough which is one, we could see the problem and it's pretty crazy that there's no curb cuts, like let alone like proper ADA curb cuts and all that. But the other thing was that DOT had held off in part because there was scaffolding on one of the buildings at the east corner, like the northeast corner, which they would have had to wait for it to come down. But then we realized that it had come down but they didn't know it yet. So now that is back and requests are being made. And hopefully that, and Lyle, after I finish, then maybe you can jump in if you have anything like more recent information. Um, DOT has taken another look at something that they have looked at before, which is, is there, I think I'm using the term right. They do what's called a warrant study. Does a site warrant a stop sign so they look at volumes plus accident data um and unfortunately have turned down that request at 160th and the upper roadway of riverside drive um so i think lyle we will want to understand do we have any options that are not a stop sign, such as like one of those little reminder signs that's like yield to pedestrians in the crosswalk. Um, Cause you need something. So we'd certainly like to know what the options are. Um, do, 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 do. And then a question that is both specific to upper roadway, as well as the rest of CB12, Lyle, is that a few months ago, you guys presented the residential loading zone initiative within DOT. And at the time, um, took some suggestions. You were requesting feedback for, you know, ideas people had for good sites for residential loading zones. And so I guess we're interested to know where is that at? Have any been implemented? If not, when is there implementation? Do we know anything about sites that might be approved? And Jody at the time had had talked about, and then we talked about again on the walkthrough, there are a couple of prime spots for loading zones there, particularly because there's nowhere for a truck to be on the upper roadway besides the sidewalk. Um, so that, and okay. So Lyle, I'm going to let you talk for a minute. What am I missing? And then I guess I want to also remind people there was a certain set of things that, that we talked about at the update, which Jody, when you, the meeting that you were not here um, when you were out, uh, Bruce sort of shared the detail on the walkthrough and all the various items. And I guess, um, and then, but but one aspect of that was that once the viaduct work is done, which is hopefully not too long in the future, then then I think we'll we'll see certain things in that area. Like I want to see how then traffic settles once there aren't all those 
all that mess on Riverside, on on Big Riverside. Um, so that includes some of the other things on the list. So I don't mean to, I don't want to go through the whole punch list now, but um, but I, yeah, I'd like to just know, Lyle, if you can respond at all to both the loading zones and do we have any other options at 160th and the upper roadway that that perhaps we could request? Okay. Um, regarding, oh, I don't have any updates uh, to provide tonight, but I can take back all the questions that you asked and see if we can get some updates for you. Um, I did take back the requests for the neighborhood loading zones um, along the upper stretch of Riverside to our freight division. So that's currently under review. Um, I can ask, we do have a division, I think I mentioned it before in the past, our Burr engineering division is uh, in charge of the signage um, for DOT. We uh, have each individual for office for those. Um, I can uh, ask my colleagues if they might have any suggestions for signage that might not be. Well, again, like, there aren't stop signs that we could put there ideally to alert drivers uh, to pedestrians in that area. Um, I'm not sure if anything, if anything specific, but I can ask. Right, um, and then just Jody, you have your hand up. Plus, if you could clarify, I can't recall now. Are there crosswalks painted on all, like on at one sixtieth and Riverside crossing Riverside? So wait a minute. What are you asking, Debbie? Let like me. There, wait. Are, there are crosswalks at one sixtieth. Yeah, and there is a pedestrian safety sign there. So oh, there, there is there there is a pedestrian safety sign. The real problem at that intersection specifically, and why we really need a stop sign there, is because and and it's a it's a culmination of problems, right? So when you have all the traffic and these massive trucks parking on the sidewalk, that particular stair is the major thoroughfare from Lower Riverside to Broadway. And people pop up that stair all the time. And when you have those massive FedEx trucks, trucks and Fresh Direct, and they all park right at the stairs because that's the big intersection where cars can, can maneuver around them pretty easily on this one-way road. So a, a stop sign there would really be the probably safest thing we can do because people do not pay attention to the pedestrian safety sign there. And I have had that experience. I have to park on the sidewalk to unload my groceries. I've had a FedEx truck parked right at the stairs, just below the stairs, and a family, a father with two kids popped up right at that truck. And the two kids popped out and I was coming around. I was going slow enough that I was able to stop, but because I was coming off the curb. But if you've got cars going, they go 30, 35 miles an hour on that road. And there isn't a single say uh measure to slow traffic down at all and especially at that at that intersection i mean right. I, so I maybe we can get signage that um also for the pedestrians at the top of the stairs so that yeah maybe that's a good idea debbie so all right so i don't want to have a big discussion about it now but like let's yeah, while, no, like, I, I yeah. connect with the signage people like I, I i understand how these warrant studies work and the no on the stop mm -hmm. sign but like it's just it's not good, so we just like to we'd like to spin again and see what our options are. Yeah, yeah. that's good. And then just the loading zones, and and that would be important. And then, may can I just suggest one other thing, Debbie? And then I'll stop. Please. Yeah, um, is the 158th Street. If we can't get a raised crossing walk there, which I understand the problems associated with it, if if we could at least look at traffic turning lights there, because if you have a six point intersection there and you don't have mm -hmm. traffic being controlled in any way by turning lights um, that allow 
you know, people to know when, you know, everybody rushes at that six point intersection and you've got pedestrians. I, you were there, Debbie, when, when we had that happen where car, we had fire trucks coming down, we have bicycles coming down, and then we have traffic trying to turn as, as traffic is trying to move forward and they're going six different directions and there's no ability to, to um, guide the traffic at all. And I think if they could have traffic turning lights there, I think it'd be really helpful helpful all right yeah we can definitely um, i can put the request in for a turn study on your behalf at the intersection yeah. um one question i have do you think that if there were loading zones installed along upper river side as you requested um that might alleviate some of the pressure at least as far as you know the desire for a sign at 160th you know considering that the neighbor loading zones would you know, take up some curbside space where those trucks would be able to park theoretically. Um, maybe, you know, that might be able to help at least, you know, the idea would be to alleviate pressure or car traffic behind those vehicles. So maybe with the installation of a loading zone or two along that curb on the east side, um, maybe that might help to kind of keep 160th and reverse that intersection a little more visible. Um, so I can, I can look into that a little bit more to see where we stand um, like I said, I did put the request in um, on your behalf for locations on Upper River, Riverside. Um, okay. So I'll see where we stand and I'll get back to you. Um, okay. okay, great. Thank you. Um, yeah. And then let's, and then as you have timing on when the whole program might be implemented, please do share it with us yeah, because sure. I'm, I'll check in with them and um, I'll get back to you as soon as you get back. No problem. Um, Jim, is that a new hand? Yes, um, I have a couple of comments. I just for so the new people want to spend like two seconds talking about warrants. In order to install any kind of traffic control device for cars, um, there are national standards in terms of traffic and turning ratios and this and this and this. And if it weren't for those national standards, which are called warrants, some communities would have a stop sign on every corner just to drive through the. <laughs> So there, there are actually na national standards and you cannot put in one of these, and that includes traffic lights also. So that's, that's that piece of it. Now, but I've heard other things. Um, I heard people are driving 35 miles an hour. The speed limit in New York now, I believe is 25. And so they're not allowed to drive that speed. It's dangerous for them to drive that speed. And the other piece of it, of course, is assuming you have pedestrian crosswalks, the state law is you have to yield for pedestrians in crosswalks. And we have these pretty signs with the pedestrians on them. And there seems to even be one there to remind drivers that that's what the law is. But again, if you don't yield to a pedestrian in a crosswalk, and this is, you know, it's true here and you know, it's more so in California, but that's the law here too. Um, you again have committed a traffic violation. So I, I know, and then this has been the situation, certainly since, you know, the attack on the World Trade Center, that the police primarily pr protect us from the te terrible terrorists and such, but a little traffic enforcement would be appropriate too. And as we all know, this is all done by the police department. So part of it, I think, you know, unfortunately, and, and this is why we actually met with the um, Public Safety Committee earlier, because we need the police to help us with this. Um, both the issue of the excessive speed and people not yielding for pedestrians is a matter of enforcement. And the other thing, which we all know about enforcement, and I, I'm willing to bet the police department knows it too, if you enforce things just sporadically, but just enough to remind people what's going on, they will start following the rules. You don't have to enforce constantly. This is a known thing. Of, I mean, look at what they do with the, you know, the, the, the buses you can get on and off of. Every now and then when you get off the bus, there are agents there. And if you don't have the ticket, you will pay the city $100. And this actually encourages many people to follow the rules. So a little bit of enforcement can go a long way. And I think, you know, I want to compliment Debbie and the others involved in our working together with this other committee. This is, this is one of the issues we have to push. Thank you. Thanks, Jim. Um, and then forgive me if I gave this update last month, but um, 
because I'm now not remembering what dates things happen relative to our meetings. But sort of the other end of this area that we have tracked over time is 165th Street and Riverside. And sort of the challenges of getting across that intersection if you wanted to get into the park. Um, DOT will come to us hopefully either September, October in there um, with a proposal for that spot, um, which I'm pretty sure they said they've been looking at for like over 10 years. So um, we can look for, we'll be looking forward to that in the fall. Um, I, I want to say one item that Jay brought up, and I think I want to relate it to, to new business, although with a slightly different twist than he brought it up. Um, some people may have seen there were some signs up in the area um, about re reassignment of some of the remaining um, of elevator operators and asking for community support. Um, so this was sort of a TWU, a union action that related to the reassignment of that of that personnel. As part of that action, and people may have seen there have been a lot of flyers up about that. Um, besides sort of the labor action part of it, of the of uh, the reassignment of these positions and is this aspect of like I think everywhere but it's certainly true we've heard about it a lot in CB12 is people feel vulnerable like especially if you've been around New York for a long time we used to be able to count on MTA personnel on the stations token booths elevators and all of that has really gone, much of that has gone away. Not all of it, but much of it. And, and people feel increasingly vulnerable. So I do not plan to raise the issue at this meeting for any sort of like resolution that relates to the labor action. I don't feel like that's appropriate for a pseudo government entity to sort of get in the mix on that part. I mean, and particularly also because it's like people we reassign, like they're not losing their jobs, but, and I, and I also feel like for better, or for worse, you know, security in the station is the job of NYPD, not of MTA. However, <laughs> however, however, it is something we hear from people. And I think most people do feel that way, that it is a loss in our stations. So what I would like to do, again, for sort of, because remember, this is our last meeting for a while, is there is a new position that is being introduced as part of these customer service centers, um, which are sort of where they're basically taking what used to be our token booth clerk, let's say, and they're creating a customer service position of somebody that moves around the station. Like they don't stay in a booth and they're there to help you with like the kiosks and wayfinding and, you know, just answering questions. And I think that's awesome to have people that are not in a booth and that they're coming around the station. And I think that this exists in a few high traffic stations, 168th street, is slated as part of that initiative for 2023. So I sort of, in talking to Jay the other day about sort of this, all of this, I thought one, like the MTA is doing more of this as they launch that Omni thing, because they're definitely going to need more help for people to sort out new technology and all that. 
Um, but that initiative seems to be only a few stations at a time. Like there's three now, maybe we'll have like a total of 15 or 20 by the end of the year. But our stations are not with the exception of 168th high traffic station. So I'm kind of, my idea would be to do something in September, October and ask the MTA to come talk to us about Omni. And I know they presented at the aging committee, but I, they should come to ours as well about when the 168th implementation is going to happen. And also like what options are there for not a busy station, but to have customer service personnel in the station? Like, is there any vision on that? And um, because I think most people would agree that, yeah, I think I'm repeating myself now. So that's sort of my proposal, but I will, um, yeah, of how to handle that issue. Um, and Jay, would you like to take uh, maybe a dissenting position on all of this? <laughs> well, well there's, there's a couple of points. Um, I don't know. <clears throat> that the, the uh, leaflets posted at various places in the neighborhood by the Transport Workers Union Local 100 are actually contract related at all. I don't know whether assigning personnel who were elevator operators is or is not a contractual question. Many of those people, if not all of them, were light duty employees. And in fact, if they were, rather than being reassigned, they'd be pensioned off when they could have been working and it probably is costing us more money in that regard. Uh, on the question of uh, public safety and convenience, I do think that there were promises made by the MTA regarding those stations which aren't being kept. And those, uh, those promises were made uh, as the new elevators were installed in each of those stations, and they were that the same number of elevator operators would be there to assist the public. And in fact, those elevator operators would be serving many of the functions that uh, the former token booth clerks would be serving on the platform and would have the information to obviate some of those questions. From what I've seen of the 181st Street station on the A train, which I believe, although I might be mistaken, has been characterized in the past as being a heavy use station. Uh, the former uh, token booth clerks are now sitting in a temporary structure on the platform. And for instance, if you have problems with the uh, Metro card <laughs> machines, there's no one there to assist you now, which there was when they, when they were in the token booths, although that was their only function. And I can't say they were well utilized beyond that since they don't sell Metro cards anymore. Um, I think this is something of a problem for, for passengers. For instance, I needed to refill uh, my Metro card 
and both of the machines were out. And uh, um, the clerk said, yes, that's true, please go ahead. If there hadn't been someone there, I would have had to have found a different subway station, uh, walk to a different subway station. So that, that's sort of a question. Uh, well, I actually, don't so let's it, wrap, wrap up, wrap this up. Like, what's your question? Like, what do you, what do you want our takeaways to be? From, first like, of all, I don't think this is a labor management question from the point of view of the community board at all. It's a public safety and a public accommodation question for, for the Traffic and Transportation Committee and is one which is worth discussing by this committee in September on that basis, as opposed to a labor management question when we're not even sure if this is a labor management question that the collective bargaining agreement in any way, shape or form addresses. But I think then we're sort of in agreement. Like I, I think sort of the larger conversation is, is very much worth having. having. Um, okay. Uh, so, um, yeah. And I, I, I think it's worth hearing from MTA just sort of how they think about, again, the, these customer service roles and like, well, is the intention to do more than scratch a surface, and 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 if not, why not, and and all of that? Because it makes a heck of a lot of sense to have customer facing people talking to customers um, and helping customers. Uh, Jim, thank you. It's my understanding that the policy throughout the transit system is that the token, so-called token clerks, the former token clerks. Sometimes they're in their booths and sometimes they're not. So that's, and it's to, the, you know, as, as several people pointed out, to change the kind of customer service available or make it available in more places or whatever. Now, I believe the, the temporary token booth that Jay is talking about isn't on the platform, at least on her age first, it's on the mezzanine. And it's pro it was probably moved because of the construction taking place, you know, by the elevators there. But um, the, the other piece of it, and I think Jay brings up a, a significant point. Let's say this customer service person who used to be called a token, token clerk and now has these additional responsibilities is out on the station helping someone with, you know, operating one of those touch screens or whatever. But there you are and you need help at the turnstile. Well, there should, and you're going to be annoyed when I say this, there should be a button and you push the button and it, they get a beep and they know that in fact they that thing should actually be an intercom you know i'm here i can't get in what should i do and then the, the this individual can come help you and that would be every place with with you know now i realize that that's sort of a dirty word because i think most of us have been to the the large chain supermarkets that are not, um pharmacies that are now deserting us and everything's locked up and they have buttons too. And those buttons are a joke because you can push them all you want, nobody comes. But ideally the, you know, the customer service person would come. So I, I think, you know, um, as, as Jay pointed out, I believe, you know, at some point they won't be, they, they're not selling tokens anymore. They're not be doing Metro cards anymore. This is all be, being done by some kind of Omni thing, which ideally will work right. And I believe it does. But again, they, they will have these other uses, but one of the purposes that they have to um, serve is that if you have trouble getting in, they have to come help you. So that was just my thought about this button. I mean, you know, buttons yep. can be implemented properly or not. Thank you. Okay. Could I, so could I add? Of, yeah, and then Bruce, just give me a minute. Like, I think that's just in summary. So now that's two people think like, yes, let's have a broader conversation with MTA on yeah, customer service presence in our stations and 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 what that should 
ideally look like. Bruce? Yeah, to add to your point, and Jay and Jim, uh, there's some security issues with uh, station ambassadors, so to speak, walking around. And if there's any protection that goes on, how do they interface with the police and so forth? Let's put it off till September. Thank you. Yeah, no, abs- absolutely. Because I think that's really what underlies this. When people say, oh, I don't feel safe or whatever, but it's like, and then I felt safer because there was an elevator person or a token booth person. Like they are not there to protect us for bad things. Like that is a police. And in this moment, there has been this increase of police in this system, but that's not like a concept. I don't know, it's complicated. Tracy? To speak to the security issue that sometimes, whether separate and apart, what DOT does is they're there to bear witness also, right? Like the reason why the elevator person was in, and, and the token booth person or whatever these particular roles are important is you knew exactly where they are. So as a young person or a person that's not feeling able-bodied or a person with a small child, you knew where you could go or stand and not be alone. So it's not necessarily that you need police presence, but you just want to know where there's another person in in the evening on a desolate station, specifically speaking to 160 East Street, that is two levels, right? And it's underground. And, you know, that just knowing that you could stand by the elevator, and there was going to be an employee nearby. And and then you could wait for the train kind of at the top of the steps, just just knowing that there's people. So I, I think when we're saying security, I think we need to sort of umbrella think about it that doesn't necessarily mean NYPD. And just one other small point, because I know we're tight on time, is that it's also about not everyone can read maps. Not everyone understands train when, you know, we got 50 million train change in on weekends and what's <laughs> going on. You know, that was the other peace that these people fulfilled. So having them at stationary locations as someone to bear witness, someone to nearby, someone to give information because people don't always either speak the language, can read the map, maybe you're an audio learner, maybe, you know, so for all the things. In support, let's talk about it. You'll have to come back when it's on on there because you've articulated it so, so brilliantly. And I and again, if you look at the press releases on these customer service centers for the few stations that are, have them, they use that language. So I think the way you've articulated it, that it's a, that's that's every station, right? We all need that. We all need wayfinding. We all need to have a place where we feel like, yeah, all those things you said, I won't repeat it. Um, Two more things. Um, Leo, did you have a a chance to look at the uh, crash and accident data for the past month or for CB12? Leo? Okay, that's not that's let's not worry about that. Um, next two weekends, yeah, I think the sixteenth and the twenty third weekends, um, there will be no A service above one hundred sixty eighth. I think it alternates between that relates to signal enhancements on the on the line um there's been a lot of that people are tired um we had somebody in the chat sorry no okay if maria's still here no not no update on that um 
and we probably won't look at that area writ large for a little while in terms of the bigger picture um, that that would include. Um, Paul D, I'm going to um, just provide in the chat my CB12 email and you can send your comment about the BX6 and then um and then and then we'll deal with like what's the best way to contend with that like if it's something we should schedule or something we can do in the midst of the month outside of meeting Okay. I feel like the minute we get off, I'm going to remember things that more things, but uh, so this concludes another season, CB12 season on TNT committee. I enjoy you all and appreciate you all immeasurably. Thank you for a great year. Um, you know where to find me. I'll keep you posted if anything comes up that you should all know about. Um, reading materials, et cetera. I found some interesting, there's some interesting stuff about City Bike that came out. So I'll send you some information on that and utilization. And utilization with the um, program that's made available to NYCHA residents and other folks. And it, utilization data is like it's like fantastic um if anybody has ideas of things that they would like to make sure that we talk about and add to an agenda next fall please let me know um and with that can i get a motion to adjourn i'm going to take jim's clapping as as like the motion um Okay. Now I'm I know. also thanking you for your efforts as well. <laughs> um, thank right. you, Debbie. All right. Thank you all. Have See a good summer, soon. all. Yeah. Most Bye, definitely. Everybody. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Have a good summer. You all too. Right. Bye, Lyle. Thanks for everything, Lyle.